Hello, you sentient ball of stardust. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a therapist, and I'm an author of the book, How to Keep House While Drowning, where I talk about ways to make it a little bit easier to take care of yourself when you're overwhelmed, stressed, have mental health issues, physical health issues, or maybe you're just in a hard season of life. Maybe you're looking for a place that you can come and listen to some practical advice. This is a podcast for all of the self-help rejects. We're going to talk about skills for survival and self-kindness. And I'm going to leave the pop psychology at the door. I promise not to tell you to meditate or to journal. We're just going to give you some really insightful conversations with hopefully some practical advice. So I don't believe you need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I don't want you to just try harder. And I don't believe that laziness exists. So join me over on Struggle Care, where we can find compassionate solutions that help us function a little bit better. New on Curiosity Stream. I'm James Burke. I'm going to take you on a journey through time. James Burke's visionary series returns, reimagined for our time. Now, this is all uncharted territory. The Washington Post hails Burke as one of the most intriguing minds in the Western world. The New York Times raves he careens from one great moment in history to another. Where do we want to go from here? Experience all new connections. So what's the next connection? With monthly, annual, and bundled plans, find the one that works for you at curiositystream.com. Stoveleg Media, igniting conversation. Hey guys, y'all won't believe what I just did. I just recorded this entire 32 minute episode on mute. I am speechless. That's the first time in a year and a half of being a podcaster that I have done this. And I really like it wants to dampen my mood because I was in an incredible mood. I was like vibing so hard and I still am vibing just not on the same level of vibration as I was on. But anyway, um, (laughs) it's honestly really funny and it was really funny how I realized I did it. But that just means that when I record the Patreon episode for this month, like, I'm recording that this evening also, just means that I'm going to hit the line extra hard. Because I'm going to super, oh, I'm so sorry, I just burped a little bit. I'm going to super deserve it. (laughs) This is a hot mess of an episode now. Um, And I was super happy with the first one, so I'm just so sorry. Anyway, hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to another episode of I've Been Thinking. Oh my gosh, welcome to another episode. If this is your first time here, you're in for a ride. I'm so sorry this is how it began. If you're back, thank you for coming back. Thank you for sticking it out with me. Thank you for being you. And... (laughs) I just can't believe I did that. Okay, well, anyway, I want to start this episode out. Before we get into the story, I want to tell you guys, seriously, thank you for being my listeners. The The loyal fans out there, thank you. And I want to ask you guys two little favors, okay? So first of all, this is the easiest one. This is the one that I am really hoping for most. Because it's free, it is minimal effort. If you could share the podcast with somebody this week, you have no idea how grateful I would be. Please send it to a friend, send it to somebody, share it with somebody you think would love it. Put it on your Instagram story, you know, just share share the podcast because that is how people are going to find out about it. That's how people are going to listen And that's how we're going to grow this community. And that's what I really want us to be is a community of all of my listeners, all of my friends and family and listeners and everybody being able to come together and talk about things. So I would be so, so, so stinking grateful if you could do that for me. And then number two, 
If you could, if you are in the place financially, and I totally get it if you're not, if you could go check out the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash I've been thinking pod for as low as $5 a month. (laughs) I wanted that to kind of sound like a weird salesperson. I'm sorry. That might have been too weird. Um, Anyway, for as low as $5 a month, you can provide really helpful support for the podcast. I actually just realized earlier today that as of last month, I think, I think I've done the math pretty much right. I have paid myself back for a lot of what I have monetarily invested into the podcast. Not all of it entirely, but a lot of it. And now moving forward, I will begin to be able to, first of all, the podcast will start paying for itself, Um, you know, paying for the hosting service, that kind of thing. Well, the website, you know, those stuff, those things. Um, But pretty soon it will start to... um, you know, give me a little bit of profit and that will allow me to invest more into it. And that is really what I want to do to be able to invest more into creating quality content, creating more exciting, thought provoking content for you guys to consume. And that's just a dream. Okay. And more treats for you guys Uh, you know, stickers, things like that. And I'm just really excited about all of those things. So if you can, if you are in the place to, don't feel pressured, go check out patreon.com forward slash I've been thinking pod. It's also in my bio in, in the podcast bio on Instagram. Um, and again, if you cannot contribute monetarily, I am so, so grateful If you just share it with somebody this week, that is literally so helpful. Just share it with one, two, three, four, five people. Just one is enough. But if you share it with like 25 people, I'll cry. Um, And if you put it on your Instagram story, I would be thrilled. So please, please, please go out there and share the podcast this week. Now, into the thick of it. Um, I am coming to y'all this week feeling renewed in some ways and inspired and kind of more hopeful than I have in a while. And so hopefully that will be represented in how awesome of a topic I think that this is. Um, I really hope that the whole recording, the whole episode on mute incident doesn't put a damper on this, but we're just going to call it my practice run. I don't usually do that, but that's what we're going to call it today. I did a practice run. So here we go. Today, we're discussing the complex intersection of the women's suffrage movement with prohibition in the United States. Because, you know, I've just been thinking a lot about how we're just not taught enough in school. Like our history classes, it's just checking boxes. And I get it, a lot of teachers go in and they're passionate about a subject and they really want it to be fun and they want to teach you everything and they want you to love history as much as they do or love math or, you know, English or whatever. But especially in in grade school and high school, I think, and then also in public schools, and I did go to a public school, K-12, through uh, well, no, preschool was private. K through 12 was public. Anyway, um, I think that it just, that they just get burnt out and I don't blame them. I don't blame them one freaking bit, you know? So I just, my professor, he was, or my high school history teacher, he was an awesome teacher in a lot of ways, but it was very much just checking boxes and I didn't learn about a lot of the complexities of history until later. And I know that a lot of people across across the United States certainly have similar experiences because that's where I got this topic from Reddit. I saw it on a Reddit thread and somebody saying something like, why don't we learn about this? And I was like, 
I, I want to research this. I want to learn more about this. I want to understand this. I don't just want to take Reddit's word for it because even though they're good for some stuff, you know, I want to do some research and understand what they're saying. And boy, I'm glad I did because this is good, you know? I think, I just think it's so sad how, I guess, how burnt out our teachers get because you're really lucky, I think, if you get a good professor in college who is still really, really stinking passionate about their field. And my history credit that I had to take in college, I had an incredible professor for that. Frank was his name. That's what I called him all four years. I had him my freshman year. I called him Frank the whole entire time. He was incredible. I loved him so very much. He was just a super kind man. But also he was passionate. He was so passionate. And he would go off on tangents about ancient Rome and blah, blah, blah. We had a test. Our final exam actually was Dante's Inferno themed. And I still to this day think this is so cool. It was like, you know, this person, this person, and this person from history are in the seventh level of hell where X is happening. I don't remember what all the levels of hell are off the top of my head. But it's like this person, this person, and this person are experiencing this in the seventh level of hell. Explain why. And we had to apply Dante's Inferno to actual history. It was just his way of making it fun and making us think critically. And I thought that was so awesome. I still think it's so awesome. Clearly, I'm fangirling over him right now. Frank, peace up. Thank you for being you. But, like, I mean, that that's so rare, I think. It's unfortunate. But anyway, um, yeah, so I was just thinking about how we're not taught a lot of these awesome things. And it is just, it's sad. So, that's what I'm here to do for you guys. That's what the podcast is about, is exploring these ideas and... You know, I've realized lately that I've not been doing it to the extent that I want to. I've not been going deep enough, I think. And so I'm going to really be making an effort to do that, to do that more, to be better about it, and to put more effort into encouraging you guys to think critically. Because I really do think I've been kind of skimming over that, and I'm sorry. And I don't want to do that anymore. Anyway, today we are discussing the complex, complex intersection of suffrage and prohibition. I'm so excited. Now, in January of 1919, Nebraska became the 36th state to ratify the 18th Amendment, and that is where prohibition began. So Congress would go on to spend the next year actually um, figuring out how it was going to work, which is not surprising at all that it like took that long because, you know, it's Congress. They're not really known for their speed. They're not really known for doing things in an effective, in a, what's the word? I, I love this. Um, you know, doing things quickly, effectively, that kind of thing. I can't think of the word. I'm sorry. Oh, effectively. No, efficiently, efficiently. So anyway, (laughs) Congress isn't very efficient. You can tell them I said that. So they spent the next year working on the technicalities of guidelines and enforcement and all of that stuff. And then prohibition itself would go on to last for 13 years and become some of the most infamous in American history. So I want to give a little bit of the backstory. You know, not everybody knows kind of what happened in prohibition. And then we also have some listeners in... England, you know, across the pond, and some listeners in varying countries, which I'm super thankful for. That's so crazy. Hey, guys. Uh, Hey, Liam. You know, good stuff. So, (laughs) 
Prohibition is where we get moonshiners like my great-grandpa was. He made the best shine in all of the nearby counties. And original gangsters like Al Capone and crime syndicates. That all came from Prohibition. Literally created the stuff of legends, the stuff of F. Scott Fitzgerald books, and you know, subject matter for crap tons of modern movies. The Roaring Twenties were what they were because of Prohibition. And that's why speakeasies were a thing. Prohibition, you had these hidden bars in the backs of you know, hardware stores. And that's that's still a thing. Actually, they're like coming back. They're super trendy right now. People love going into a hardware store after hours and going <laughs> on a door and you get let in and you're served overpriced cocktails. People love that. I get it. I would love it too. I just don't, I can't pay for overpriced cocktails at the moment. So <laughs> the effects that prohibition had on American culture and morality still stand today. Whether it's the fact that the Dukes of Hazard, like it was a TV show for a really long time and then they made it into a movie with Jessica Simpson back in the day. They were running shine, in case you didn't know. Um, and then stock car racing and speed boats, though that came from out running the cops while transporting illegal alcohol. That came from run and shine and rum running. And even cocktails were basically invented and popularized during this time. I don't get that one. I don't know. I tried to look it up and I didn't find anything that gave me any kind of explanation. Maybe I didn't look in the right places. I will continue researching that one. But like my only thought, like my first thought was that people started making cocktails. So it would be like, oh, this is juice. It does not have any gin in it. What are you talking about? Um, but that's not true. So also cocktails weren't invented. Like that was already kind of a thing, I think, but they were definitely popularized and a lot of popular ones were invented during that time. So anyway, wanted to clarify that statement. Okay. But the most lasting and also the most surprising legacy of prohibition is that it was a part of the women's rights movement. And that's why we're here today. Now, since the mid-19th century, Allison, that's the mid-1800s, in case you were confused. Uh, <laughs> I love you. Women had been super outspoken about alcohol and alcoholism because their husbands, their dads, their brothers, the men in their lives would go out to the tavern or the pub and drink away the rent, drink away the mortgage, drink away the grocery money, come home, beat their wives, beat their children, maybe not even come home at all and then miss work the next day and lose their job. And it was causing a lot of problems. So that's right, y'all. You heard it right. You heard it here. Men couldn't handle their liquor, and that's why their wives got pissed and said, you can't get your shit together, so we're going to take it away from you. And they did. They did do it. Now, I do want to say that a big part of the problem truly was that at the time, drinkers were more likely to turn to stronger products to become inebriated. I don't know 100% if that means that, like, everything was a higher alcohol content. I think that might be true. I don't know if they had the level of, you know, regulation that we do today. I'm actually quite pretty sure that they probably didn't have the level of regulation we do today where, you know, things have to be certain reasonable alcohol contents. So I would say that that probably played a part. Also, it seems just from the research that I've done that, but I can't give you like a legitimate source for this. This is just me guessing. Um, it kind of seems like liquor was more so the go-to. So then people were just drinking straight hard liquor. It was a higher alcohol content, obviously, than beer probably would be. Uh, like I said, it probably wasn't regulated. So who knows what the content actually was. 
and then they, they were just drinking it straight. It's not watered down. It's not mixed with anything. So they drink it faster. So then they drink more. So it was just a recipe for disaster. So perhaps that is where cocktails came in. Like they started mixing it with things so that people wouldn't get shit faced so fast. I really don't know. Plus, if you think about it, you can make more money with cocktails because more goes into it or you can say more goes into it for sure but more goes into it and you can be like straight shot of tequila is two dollars but a margarita is six dollars and it's a shot of tequila with just a bunch of lime juice and sugar in it but people pay six i pay six dollars for a margarita like i get it so it probably was a good business model to switch to cocktails if you think about it because people are buying more to get the same level of drunk that they would have been off less anyway (laughs) so it was an interesting time like I said and the wives were pissed the wives the mothers the women were pissed and I don't blame them So, the media actually played into this. They were actually useful to an extent in getting Prohibition passed, uh, which I think is super interesting. And it wasn't all women partaking in the media either. So, in 1847, a British caricaturist, George Cruikshank, um, released a brutal, a brutal, released a set of illustrations showing the, quote, brutal violence a brutal set of illustrations. Now, he released a set of il- illustrations showing the brutal violence that is the natural consequences of frequent use of the bottle, wherein a husband is shown preparing to punch his wife in the one little box. You know how in a comic strip it's like in boxes. So in the one, he's shown preparing to punch his wife. And then in the next illustration, the wife's body is on the ground. And there's a group of people around her, and it's captioned, The husband kills his wife with the instrument of all their misery. And the thing is, it's true. Like, yeah, it was a caricature. It was meant to, like, dramatize it a little bit. But it's a more than sound point. It's more than valid. It's a trillion percent accurate. And it was so frustrating And it was for the women of the time, and it was affecting more than just a handful of them. It was affecting more than just middle-class women, more than just poor women. It was affecting more than just rich women. It was affecting anybody of any social class, any, anything, mother, wife, daughter. It was affecting everybody. It was so bad That it got ratified into a constitutional amendment. Like, I think that gives us an idea of how bad it was. How horrible men were acting. So, one woman, her name was Carrie Nation. And she was a major temperance activist. She, like, her name should be up there with some of the others that come along in, like, in this And it actually is, but, like, she should literally be taught about in history class. And I'm pretty sure she's not. I'm pretty sure we never learned about her. So that's annoying. Whatever. Um, Anyway, Carrie Nation, sometime around 1900, 1901, she became so damn fed up with the whole situation with getting beat by her husband every night when he came home in a drunken rage that she went out back of the bars in Wichita, Kansas, and destroyed their inventory with a hatchet. Beer bottles, kegs, barrels, everything flying. Like, and people just laughed at her, and they were like, well, she's insane. And she actually started writing op-eds for the papers and everything, saying, no, I'm not insane. I'm pissed. I'm fed up. And there has to be something done about this. Women are being murdered and we're not being taken seriously. Obviously, they're not being taken seriously. So now this is super interesting, okay? Susan B. Anthony 
and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, like the suffragettes, the leaders of the women's rights movement, which, by the way, Katie Korn, if you're listening, I know you usually are, uh, can you tell me if you're named after Elizabeth Cady Stanton? Because I just realized y'all's names are spelled the same, and I'm super curious now. Okay, sidebar over, back to it. Um, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton founded the Women's State Temperance Society in upstate New York in 1853. In a lot of ways, this is where the women's rights movement began for those two, because they realized that the only way to get alcohol banned was to give women the right to vote. Susan B. Anthony was, like, super anti-alcohol. She called it the unclean thing. Like, she was super anti-alcohol. And I don't, I think that there's, like, probably a lot of personal stuff that goes into that. Probably also religious stuff. I don't know. Um, I don't know the details on that one. But, yeah, they knew that the only way to get alcohol banned was to allow women to vote. Because men was, men weren't going to get rid of this thing that they loved doing in spite of the fact that it was helping them literally ruin their own lives and murder their wives and children. But women were sick and tired of being the victims, and I don't blame them one bit. So they they did it for themselves. They stood up for themselves, and bravo for them. Okay? Then, we get Prohibition passed, And it actually gets passed before the women's right to vote, which is shocking. And then a woman gets put in charge of enforcing it. Like, what a girl power moment. 32-year-old assistant U.S. attorney general, which first of all, 32 years old, assistant U.S. attorney general, Mabel Walker Willebrandt was the highest ranking woman in the government at the time and one of the first women appointed to a sub-cabinet position in the United States government. She oversaw prohibition through three presidential administrations. Can you imagine being 32 and being the assistant U.S. Attorney General? That's crazy. To me, at least. I don't know. The closer, like, the further I get into my 20s, the wilder that sounds. And I've always been super aware that like, like 30's not old, feels old, kind of when you're 26, but it's not old. 50's not old. You've got a lot of time still, even at 50. But just like being 32 and having achieved something like that is so crazy and awesome. Like go Maple. She was doing the damn thing. And So, anyway, (laughs) before I, like, fangirl her too much, Washington, D.C. recognized that women had been the primary source of getting prohibition enacted, and so they felt that a woman should be in charge of it, should be in charge of enforcing it, which, if you left it there, is kind of nice. It's kind of a nice sentiment. But the problem is that they wanted to be able to blame it on a woman if prohibition should fail. And that's where it gets shitty. And even worse, they put this job on her to keep Mabel from being appointed the first female federal judge. And she was very keenly aware that this job was given to her so that, one, she could take the blame, and two, to prevent her from achieving her dream job of being a federal judge. What? How trashy is that? How ridiculous. Infuriating. And then to add salt to the wound, to add salt to the wound, the media poked fun at her, which is shitty, but she was known as a firebrand, which can be a compliment or a derogatory term. Um, I'm going to take it back for her, and I'm going to call her a firebrand in the best way, like you go, you girl, you go, you girl, (laughs) you do, you girl, you go, girl. That's why I combine those two. (laughs) Be with me. Okay. Um, but how incredible, I would love to be called a firebrand. I would love to be called that. I am proud of her for being who she was. That's all I'll say. Okay. Now, 
Mabel is quoted actually as saying, quote, women must use the scrubbing brush in soap, which means in this context, and it was in the context of prohibition, it had been left to women to put a stop to these problems that men had created. Alcohol was often referred to as, quote, unclean, so it's super fitting that she used this phrasing. It had been left to women to clean up the mess that alcohol had created. Now, Prohibition and Mabel actually led to the building of the first federal prison for women, which is really cool how it worked out that way and, like, her reasoning in doing it. Like, prisons suck. I'm sorry that there are prisons, but there kind of have to be. Sorry if you don't agree with that, but they have to be a thing. But anyway, um... Mabel was like, hey, um, so women are running speakeasies and bootlegging to make extra money to, like, pay for their children to be able to live because their husband left them or because their husband spent all their money um, on alcohol before prohibition, you know, that kind of thing. So these women actually really deserve to be treated better than they're being treated when they get arrested for doing these illegal things, so we're going to build a jail for them, which is really awesome that she, like, did look at it with that perspective, because I doubt any man had ever thought to himself, women are probably being harassed, assaulted, like, having terrible things done to them in all-male jails, or in, like, mixed jails, I guess. Like, they, I doubt anybody had ever thought about that being a problem, but thankfully... Mabel did, uh, which is just, it's cool how that, like, happened the way it did. Now, in the late 20s, early 30s, after 13 years of prohibition, it had become pretty obvious that it was impossible to fully enforce, plus crime rates were actually rising as prohibition had led to the creation of crime syndicates. Um, that's literally where we get, like, big crime families from. So, and also, it had been impossible for Mabel to even have a ton of influence on the enforcement because the agents who were supposed to work for her and work, like, enforcing prohibition, they didn't even work for her. They worked for the Department of the Treasury, which is not what she did. So tell me, t- try to tell me she wasn't set up for failure, okay? Plus, the Great Depression is setting in at this point in time. So people are just really thinking about all of the money that could be brought in, like, you know, new jobs by bringing back alcohol, tax revenue, that kind of thing. So it kind of was too good to pass up at this point. And I don't blame them for that. I to- That totally makes sense to me. I don't blame them. I feel honestly really sad that Prohibition didn't work for what it was supposed to work for. Like it didn't. It was supposed to help women and it really didn't. That's sad. Um, yeah. But it did actually because of its intrinsic link to women's rights. Anyway. Once again, women were able to change history, change the tides, when New York socialite Pauline Morton, like Morton Salt, Sabin, I hope I'm saying her last name right, Pauline Morton Sabin founded the Women's Organization for National Prohibition Reform, which encouraged women, many of whom were lifelong Republican supporters, to vote for FDR in 1932 because FDR favored repealing the 18th Amendment, mainly for economic reasons. Also, I think it's super fun just to remind you guys that FDR and his wife, Eleanor, had an arrangement um, because Eleanor was gay. So, just a reminder, she was a lesbian and she had a lover who... She was able to move into the White House with her, To She, like, had a job in the White House, and she lived there. So, good for you, Eleanor. (laughs) Anyway, um, yeah, so FDR favored repealing the 18th Amendment. 
Um, so she wanted, Pauline wanted to get people to vote for him. Now, I really wanted to know more about why Pauline was anti-prohibition because she very much seems like an OG feminist icon that we don't learn about in history books. Surprise, surprise. Like, she seems like the type of woman to not want other women to suffer. So, I was like, why does she want to get rid of prohibition if it was about mitigating women's suffering, right? So, she said that she began to feel uneasy about prohibition. Like, her uneasiness, her doubts about it really began because she was seeing a lot of hypocrisy with politicians, who were supporting stricter enforcement, and then while they're saying, yeah, send them to jail, they're drinking a cocktail. Which, like, clearly, that's not cool. And she thought it was not cool, too. Plus, the ineffectiveness of enforcement, the seeming decline of temperate drinking, which means, like, that people seem to be drinking and partying harder now that it was illegal... Plus, the growing prestige of bootleggers and crime syndicates was super troubling for her. Fair. Valid. Uh, Pauline said that, and, and this is, I think, really what it comes down to. She said that women believed their children... Their children. <laughs> okay, let's start that over. Pauline said that she that women believed that their children would grow up without the temptations and troubles of alcohol in their lives, but instead they were growing up with a total lack of respect for the Constitution and for the law. Which, yeah, they were. Plus, saloon keepers pre-prohibition had been held to certain age restrictions, like we see today in terms of selling alcohol, and speakeasies, clearly, were not held to that standard because they were illegal. So minors were able to drink without a problem. She saw that prohibition was literally making the whole entire issue worse. Pauline had a super important, inexorable influence on American women. And she showed that elegant, refined, socialite women are allowed to read the news they're allowed to, you know, read the newspaper that had previously been their husband's property. They're allowed to speak up about their opinions and to make their voices heard. And she also brought to the forefront the fact that women do not all vote the same way, which apparently was a shock to everybody. Because the rhetoric previously had been like, a vote for this is a vote for women. And she was like, hey, uh, we actually don't all feel the same way because we don't all think the same way because this isn't working out. So, yeah. Pauline's influence, as well as Mabel's, and the others too, but these two specifically, really prove to male politicians that women have their own power. They have their own ability to act without men's help. And that men really need to consider the repercussions of that in their decision making. The 21st Amendment repealed Prohibition in 1933, and it was actually the first ever amendment to be fully repealed in its entirety, and this allowed states to control their own liquor laws, which ultimately led us to different states having different drinking ages for a while. Um, different states having blue light laws, where like you can't buy alcohol on Sundays or before a certain time of day, how certain how certain states um you can only buy alcohol beneath a certain um alcohol content you know all of that stuff that all came from putting control like giving control to the states drinking ages were actually made a federal standard via a supreme court case but that's a story for another day that's me being like a political science pre-law nerd but yeah, it's, I think it's really interesting. I think it's awesome to see how feminism and women's rights are directly and intrinsically intertwined to the passage and the repeal of Prohibition. I think it's so cool, and I hope that you guys enjoyed it too. And you got an extra five minutes of content this time around. It took, The first time was 32 minutes this time right at 38. So you're welcome 
for messing up the first time, guys. <laughs> I am so grateful for you all listening. Again, please share this episode with somebody you think will enjoy it. And if you can go check out I've been or go check out patreon.com forward slash I've been thinking um, for the sources that I used for today's episode. I've been thinking pod.com. Follow us on Instagram at I've been thinking pod. Share us with somebody. Please put us on your Instagram story. Tell your grandma. Tell your cousin. Tell your future sister-in-law's little sister-in-law. Whatever you gotta do. Shout out to you, Liz. I love you guys so, so much. Thank you for being my listeners. Thank you for being here. And I hope I will be talking in your ear next week. I love you. Bye. (laughs) Hello, you sentient ball of stardust. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a therapist and I'm an author of the book, How to Keep House While Drowning where I talk about ways to make it a little bit easier to take care of yourself when you're overwhelmed, stressed, have mental health issues, physical health issues, or maybe you're just in a hard season of life. Maybe you're looking for a place that you can come and listen to some practical advice. This is a podcast for all of the self-help rejects. We're going to talk about skills for survival and self-kindness. And I'm going to leave the pop psychology at the door. I promise not to tell you to meditate or to journal. We're just going to give you some really insightful conversations with hopefully some practical advice. So I don't believe you need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I don't want you to just try harder and I don't believe that laziness exists. So join me over on Struggle Care where we can find compassionate solutions that help us function a little bit better. With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandslots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.